Today, we thank the Embassy of uh, Mexico for sponsoring this program. And I would like to introduce Beatriz Nava, Acting Director of the Mexican Cultural Institute, who is gonna present the panel. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Beatriz Nava. I'm the Acting Director of the Mexican Cultural Institute of the Embassy of Mexico, the House of the Public and Cultural Diplomacy of Mexico in the United States. On behalf of the Ambassador of Mexico to the United States, Marta Bárcena, I would like to extend our deepest gratitude to the Library of Congress for this presentation. We are immensely proud to welcome Cristina Rivera Garza, one of Mexico's most renowned and interesting authors, who is also a distinguished professor in Hispanic studies and director uh, of creative writing at the University of Houston. We have had the pleasure of her presence in Washington DC on several occasions. The most recent, last autumn, when she was the selected scholar for the Jose Emilio Pacheco Distinguished Lecture Series the Mexican Cultural Institute runs in conjunction with the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at the University of Maryland, here represented by Dr. Ada Meredith, which, is, which this year will present Mexican author Margot Glantz. On that occasion, the Library of Congress also opened its doors to present the Taiga Syndrome in the presence of translator Susan Gill Levin and Aviva Kana from the fascinating perspective of language and sound. During that visit, we also had a first glimpse of the taiga, that fluid, fluid somewhat inhospitable place created by the narrative of Rivera Garza, which invites to the dissolution of preconceived concepts and notions. These journeys through the forbidden taiga, in words of Veronica Scott Esposito, I quote, can become places where boundaries of time, identity, and language are broken down, offering us the possibility of redefining our world and asserting some kind of agency." End of quote. Crossing boundaries, breaking them even, is part of the personal history of Rivera Garza. She was born in the Mexico-US border in Matamoros, Tamaulipas, a town across Brownsville, Texas. She has spent most of her life uh, living in the border between San Diego and Tijuana, experiencing firsthand what the border region between all countries is, a fluid space where binational communities are built in terms of language, culture, and belonging, or lack thereof. No wonder that Rivera Garza is so comfortably moving across and, blo uh, and blurring the, borders be uh, border the border territories of cross-gender writing, gender and identity. Worth noting are her musical collaborative projects with artists and composers such as Viaje, a dramatic musical piece for voice and instruments developed in Milan, Italy in 2014. Apropos music, the Taiga Syndrome, she suggests, in the Taiga Syndrome, she suggests a playlist which brings us to the state of mind she inhabited while writing the book. It is a playlist I often listen and return to. Her academic and literary interests lie also in the borderline behaviors of, and the triggers of insanity. Her doctoral research and published books on covering the hind of pre-revolutionary modernity through her research on the social history of mental illness in early 20th century Mexico from the perspective of La Castañeda Mental Hospital in 1910 has earned her the highest literary regard both in Mexico and beyond. It is well known how Carlos Fuentes praised her for no one, no one will see me cry, noting it is, I quote, one of the most notable works of fiction, not only in Mexican literature, but in the literature of Spanish speaking world at the start of the 21st century. She imagines like no one else has done in Mexico since Jose Revuelta, the traffic, the, the, since Jose Revuelta's the tragic options and the psychic turmoil caused by revolutionary theory and action with such grandeur that we must, as readers, kneel ourselves." End of quote. And this was just the beginning. She's one of Mexico's most prolific authors of her generation and has been recognized with numerous national and international awards such as the Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz Award to Excellence in Writing by a female author from, the Lat from Latin America and the Caribbean. 
She is the only writer who has won, to have won this award twice, in 2001 with precisely No One Will See Me Cry, and 2009 with La Muerte Me Da. Additionally, she has won the Anna Segers Award in 2005 and the George Roger Caloa Award for Latin American Literature in 2013. Her style has been described as, uh, by the Los Angeles Review of Books as, I quote, the perfect embodiment of the seismic shifts in Mexican literature's aesthetic and styles in the 21st century, end of quote. She writes in Spanish, sometimes thinking in English, and her work has been translated into multiple languages, including English, French, Italian, Portuguese, and Korean. Again, it's a great honor to have Cristina Rivera Garza with us today to get immersed in the taiga and the literary worlds she creates and inhabits. I give the floor now to Cristina Rivera Garza and Talia Guzman Gonzalez. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and welcome to this conversation about uh, the Taiga Syndrome by Cristina Rivera Garza. It is an honor to be here with you. Bienvenida oh, a nuestra Feria del Libro. Thank you. Uh, I am very excited to be here talking about this novel, originally published in Spanish in 2012 as El Syndrome de la Taiga, and published in English in 2018 by Dorothy Project with a beautiful English translation by Joe Levine and Aviva Cana. The Taiga Syndrome is Christina's sixth novel, and we have seen in her trajectory as a writer a movement towards bold, linguistic, and narrative experimentation. Of course, Christina was never known as a conventional author, uh, but rather someone who will always put accepted knowledge about the nature of narrative through the test. In the case of the Taiga Syndrome, she takes the tried and true genre of the detective novel and turns it into an exploration about language, borders, the effect of ruthless capitalism on the environment, madness, love, and the end of love. Hopefully we'll get to talk about some of those topics with Christina today. Well, to begin with, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the, the plot of the novel, which may seem, may seem mm -hmm. straightforward. A female detective is hired by a man to find his wife, who ran away with another man to the taiga, right? Sure. Uh, the boreal forest, and to bring her back home. However, this is just a point of departure to undergo a more nuanced exploration uh, of the capacity of human beings to relate to each other and also to the natural world. Can you talk to us about a bit of uh, the process of writing this book and how it relates maybe to your previous works? Yeah, wonderful. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you, Talia. And thank you, Beatriz, for that very generous introduction. Thank you, everyone for showing up here today. Um, I feel like Beatriz knows more about my life than I do now. <laughs> <laughs> I was learning things as, as she was speaking, which is wonderful. And, um, and thank you for being here. So uh, this is, in, in fact, yes, my sixth novel. I, I've been experimenting with different strategies, uh, being concerned with um, different aspects of being. I, I wrote, as you were, as it was mentioned here, uh, my first novel was very much based on um, uh, research on specific documents coming from an insane asylum that was founded in Mexico in 1910. It was more historically based, although I, I, I don't, don't want, I, I don't like it to be called a historical novel, rather uh, more a documentary novel. Uh, and so I've been, following my instincts, trying to be very honest in terms of the kind of questions that really interest me. I, I do believe that writing is a critical practice. I, if writing didn't offer me an opportunity to look at the world with critical lenses, I don't think I would be doing it. So uh, every single one of these books are um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a new start. If I'm lucky enough, it's a departure point. There is something there that I don't know and I need to know. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much the journey in all these books. And in this case, I had moved away from a, a more realistic tone, a more realistic exploration that was very much the, the the, the exploration in my earlier work. I had worked more in the uh, 
with the framework of the, uh, of the fantastic fantasy novels. I've been trying to explore and work, subvert, trying to subvert uh, what um, in Mexico is called as subgenres, but in the United States are obviously genres like uh, uh, the horror uh, novel or the detective novel uh, as such. And in this case, I was, um, I had large questions. Um, and then, obviously, I had to 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 narrow it down. I, I I needed to tell the story, and as you mentioned, the story is perhaps here more. Um, um, it's simple enough that that it allowed me an exploration into all all these other larger questions. One of them being, um, I wanted to investigate this issue of distance of um, how long, how far away we can go with the knowledge of what we are. Um, when, are when do we know that we have crossed enough, enough borders that we have to stop in order to be intelligible to others? And uh, what kind of decision making that, that sort of uh, framework allowed me in terms of the writing? So I wanted to do all these things that might sound too abstract right now. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I wanted my characters to be in this in this forest, in this primeval forest. But but I wanted this forest to be complicated. I uh, it was a forest in which nature and natural resources played a role, as well as uh, the exploitation uh, of them and the kind of social relationships that sprang up as a result of that. So all those things went in my mind. But I needed to follow a this specific route, this journey, this this couple that wanted to lose themselves right there. I wanted to know why. And you ask us from the beginning to join you in this journey in a very active sense, yeah. right? There is starting uh, from that very first que or that yeah. that they ask us, right? Mm -hmm. there's, um, there's a request from the reader to make, um, to be more active and participate in making uh, uh, and feeling in some spaces, right, mm -hmm. in the narrative, mm -hmm. as you are talking about, feeling, uh, feeling what's, what's unsaid. Um, how do you envision, I wanted to know about, uh, how do you envision a reader engaging with this, with this work, right? You mm -hmm. set the bar real, really high from the beginning in terms yeah. of narrative experimentation. You know how many stories, many stories ask us um, to believe them. Mm -hmm. So many stories are just in front of us, um, um, inviting us to have a specific experience that, uh, that is known or somehow legible for all, all participants. And in this case, what I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to work very hard on was the idea that there is not um, a direct connection between experience and writing. There is always, always this mediation in whatever the things we do, mm -hmm. right? So um, you were mentioning the, the presence of that K, that, mm -hmm. that, that is an indication that someone else has said this before. And we are not so sure if, if that is, a, if, if this is a, something that we as readers should or could trust. There is the issue of the unreliable narrator, mm -hmm. but it, it goes a little deeper than that. I wanted just to make sure that all of us reading the novel, participating of the novel, knew and were constantly aware of the fact that there is some, something else, there is a bridge here that we had crossed together. Mm -hmm. One of them, of course, was the, the translation in and of itself, moving to faraway places implies, of course, that we are learning uh, different languages or different aspects of languages that we already work with or live in. Um, and there, is the, the, there are other mediations here that have to do with the making and the structure of the book. Uh, we were uh, talking before coming in here how the Spanish edition of this book includes uh, drawings that to me were uh, yet another translation of the story, not a rendition of the story, but another way of enunciating it. Uh, Unfortunately, the English translation didn't come with that, and that mm -hmm. might be something that we might want to talk about or not later. But uh, I wanted readers to, to really immerse themselves in these series of transitions and mediations and, and, um, and being increasingly comfortable with the idea that there is no certainty in what is happening. 
that every single action, every single scene that we're getting invited into is a scene that we have to question. Mm -hmm. And then we have to ask questions about uh, the veracity of things, the stability of things, about um, what is really uh, going on. Mm -hmm. And to me, when books ask me to do that, when, when books invite me to do that, I just feel more responsible for what is happening, uh, for, um, for the resolution of the story, uh, and for the for the whole making of the story as such. So since I'm, I'm as a reader, I usually am I'm, I'm, I'm very much, um, I, I like that process. I, I like to be part of the story as much as I can. I'm trying to work always with structures in, in, um, in this novel making uh, process that allow the reader to, to find his or her own space. Mm -hmm her own way of directing the actions and, and making her or his own decisions mm -hmm. as, as, uh, as they continue walking and reading through the book. Yeah. Well, the reader is not the only one, right, looking for his or her space or their, their role, right, in orienting the story. We have also the character of the female detective yes. who is in this taiga and needs uh, a translator, yes. both that will assist her in understanding a space uh, that is linguistically and geographically foreign to her. Um, and as her translator, he will help her, right, navigate this. Yet there are several moments in which it's interesting because the taiga seems equally incomprehensible for him, yeah. right, for the translator who's supposed to be the expert in this region. How does this character, do you think, help us think of all these complexities involved in translation, for mm. example, not only of language, but also of space, yeah. and even within the same language? And you were just talking about medium with the drawings and the text yeah. as another type of translation. Well, I have to tell you something <laughs> about this, this female detective, this unnamed female <laughs> detective. This is not the yes. first book that I write uh, with her or with her help. Uh, this is perhaps the second complete book, but I've been writing short stories having uh, the, the guidance of this female detective. And, uh, and although she's a complex, or I like to think of her as a complex mm -hmm. character, one of the major characteristics is that she's a complete failure at what she does. Yes. And she's uh, failing continuously. She prepares for the, the next uh, mission uh, with failure in mind. And, uh, and has come to sort of like a stable relationship with failure at this point. Uh, and uh, and it, that's, that might be the reason why she's so willing to get into all sorts of intricacies in mm -hmm. the story. So instead of going for the resolution, the A through B is meandering around, uh, looking for meanings and um, digressing continuously as, uh, as she's trying to find out in this case where this couple uh, is located at that specific point. So, um, this tendency, this, uh, this capacity of dealing with uncertainty is what I guess allows me as an author to pay attention not only to, to the plot line, but to landscape, to territory, to a more complex sense of the relationships that all these characters are creating and establishing and breaking up at the same time. Uh, and that's why uh, I think, I'm, as an author, I'm able to pay attention to, to language as a, as a material component mm -hmm. of the whole adventure. Mm -hmm. So it's not only this vehicle that allows me to, to share a story with all of you, but it's this matter that is going to be, if I'm lucky, is going to be affecting all of us. Your, your sense, your imagination, but also your body. So all these elements that have to do with rhythm, with sound, with lines that are breaking, the kind of thing that we, that we go for when we are reading poetry, mm -hmm. usually, I'm, I'm working very closely with those elements uh, when, uh, when, when I'm trying to develop these stories. Mm -hmm. and, and the mind, the complex, uh, multi-layered mind of this female detective mm -hmm. has allowed me to, to do just that. There are two lines the detective repeats throughout the novel that we were talking before that I think illustrate very well what one reviewer says is 
and I quote, the skepticism about languages representational abilities, yeah. right? And it also comes across in her maybe inability to solve crimes, but also her distrust yeah. of any of forms of writing, right? And, and this report that she has to turn in uh, at the end of the case. Those two lines in the book are, it is difficult to describe what it is impossible to imagine. And then the other line is, it is impossible to imagine what can't be described. And she later says, and I'm gonna quote from the novel, if I may read in front of the author here for a little bit. Mm -hmm. In the report I would write to the man who had had two wives, I would ask him to take into account that nothing had happened exactly as I claimed. I would tell him that nothing happens as it is written. And I would constantly repeat this or something like it. I would ask him in a careful and tactful way, assuming that he knew, but realizing also that these types of things are always hard to bear in mind, to take into account that there was great distance between speech and writing. What does this say about the limits of yeah. writing and of yeah. literary writing. Yeah, no, how interesting. When, when you started to pose that question, mm -hmm. I was looking for exactly oh, that cool. passage in the Good. book. And I was going to read this to you, but now I can do it. Sorry. Dalia, she will read it. at the end. She, she will have, hear her reading. But that's, that's, I think, pretty much the challenge of the book. And to me, the challenge of all literary um, a project. Uh, we are so desperately trying to share a world, mm -hmm. but that world and the, the means that we have in order to do so are means that come tainted to us, that come uh, charged with experience, um, with, um, with its own limits as, as well. So I, I'll go back to what I was saying before. Um, I'm trying to invite you here, not only to hear how something is being developed, uh, and, and to go from the uh, starting point to the end point. I'm trying to visit as many layers of that adventure in terms of, of the language that we use uh, in order to, for that aspect of life, of real life to be conceivable and to be an experiential aspect of what we are. Mm -hmm. So um, I think what, what books have done for me, they have invited me to, um, look at what I am and what others are and the relationships that I establish with them in ways that are very difficult to describe but very certain, they feel very certain in my body mm -hmm. in terms of what I'm able to, to go for, right? And uh, I would like to think that the books that I'm writing are, are, are trying to capture that moment. So it's less a matter of uh, sharing something that I'm very certain about, mm -hmm. but and more a matter of sharing a world that I'm very eager to build with the with the reader in mind at that specific point. Mm -hmm. If we are able to that to do that together in that kind of communion, uh, I think something important is happening. I think we're able to just jump out of ourselves and and when lucky into the, the proverbial being in someone else's shoes, right? Uh, and perhaps in a, in a bit of a larger sense, in a bit also of a political sense, what this entails. Being able to, um, to visualize uh, what it is like to be other person, what it is like to occupy another space in this world, how complicated that can be, and the kind of forces that are transversing constantly this experience. So to me, that's, that's very much the challenge of writing, regardless of the story that I'm trying to tell. Mm -hmm. And at times, as, as in this case, I've, I've taken advantage of the fact that we as readers, I think, are very much familiar with the, with the, with the sense of how a detective story develops, right? And I'm trying to use that, but taking the reader with me to some other places, a little bit less, less known, both in terms of, of the landscape, uh, the descriptions, the atmosphere, but also in terms of, um, uh, of, the, of the literary um, aspect of that, of, of, the, of the crossing of other types of genres and, and ways of, um, of being one with the story. Yeah. Well, talking about the landscape, right, and that world that you want to build, that is, is not only narrative, but we're talking, there's, there's something very present in the novel, I mean, there's nature, obviously. Yeah. They're in the yeah. taiga, yeah. Um, which, uh, 
but this is not a passive landscape, no. right? No. Uh, this is not a, it's not a setting for a narrative. Um, but in your novel, it is, um, the taiga is not devoid of the power and economic structures present in the world outside of it. It's very much oriented in that sense in, mm -hmm. in some aspects, I think. There are social classes created by an extraction economy in place, you know, the lumber, mm -hmm. fish, oil, even sex, there's a sex industry. Sure. Uh, a reality that is as madness inducing, right, as the taiga, as the nature itself. Um, what does it say about the necessity uh, of our rethinking how we interact with the environment? I yeah. think there's a, there's a comment in your novel about that. Yeah, yeah very mm -hmm. much so. We have talked about this novel as, a, as a, my take on, on a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. And I've often said that the, the, the heart of this fairy tale, the fairy tale that I'm trying to articulate with in any case, is pretty much capitalism. Yeah. This story <laughs> that, that we tell ourselves is a happy, progressive story that uh, obviously is hiding a way more complex, somber, obscure, politically charged aspect. And so my way of trying to deal with that in this, in this invitation to partake of the forest, this is the mythical forest of the fairy tale, but this is also the forest of natural resources that are continuously um, excavated, exchanged, uh, um, uh, you know, produced for profit, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And you are right, uh, I think there is much to be said about that, not only from the point of view of, uh, of the human interaction in, this, in these areas, mm -hmm. but from the point of view of those elements that are usually seen as inert mm -hmm. or, or devoid of agency. Mm -hmm. So I'm, um, I'm working more and more in terms of uh, that exploration of the territory. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it's a territory that is highly coded Mm -hmm. uh, and the work that I'm, I'm doing uh, right now has, uh, is very much linked to processes of production, specifically of cotton in the, right on the border between Mexico and the United States. And to me, it's kind of like a natural offspring of being thinking about this forest as a materially complex, politically charged uh, aspect. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and now me moving back to do um, um, you know, archival research mm -hmm. and, and uh, back into the so-called real world. But, uh, and I'm talking about you know, um, another, another project. Uh, <laughs> a, a project that I'm actually right now working on. So um, I, I'm not gonna be able to go back to that more realistic uh, tone to it because I've been doing all this work as well. But I think just uh, asking those questions about this specific forest and the experience of this uh, runaway couple has allowed me mm. to, to do the full circle, so to speak, mm -hmm. and, and go back to um, those agencies of the natural world, of the material world that so much define who we are and, and the limits mm -hmm. of, of what we can do in this world. You mentioned the, the borders and uh, not only in the novel, but very present in your work as well. You're, you yourself, as uh, Beatriz mentioned before, are from the border town of Matamoros, yeah. right? Uh, in the state of Tamaulipas, next to Brownsville, Texas. And during your tenure in UCSD, you live in San Diego, next to Tijuana. And professionally, right, uh, you transit between linguistic borders too, mm -hmm. right? And also literary borders as a professor of Hispanic studies at an American um, mm -hmm. university. How does leaving and creating at the border inform your writing, if it does? <laughs> totally, mm -hmm. absolutely, uh, and, and increasingly so mm -hmm. in these times, of mm -hmm. course, right? I, I spent um, this summer back in, in TJ, in Tijuana, this, um, this border city. And uh, my friends didn't didn't believe me when they asked me why why are you doing that in Tijuana and I'm like well it's a it's a peaful place I want to write <laughs> and if you know anything about Tijuana you know the peacefulness and Tijuana just don't, don't <laughs> go together <laughs> and uh, what I what I told them was that being in that area of the world being in in in, in that place forced me it, it, I think it forces all of us living in those circumstances to ask very tough questions. If we live in some other places, I might uh, 
just get distracted and not think about how difficult it is to cross certain borders, how difficult it is to have to inhabit in a specific body and take this body across the street or you know, to different nations. And places like Tijuana won't let you get distracted. Mm. So you have to face that question. And ethically, aesthetically, you are forced to answer that question for yourself, uh, for the work that you do, for those who are going to come to your work as well. And it is in that sense that I think is, uh, is uh, I mean, it's not peaceful, of course, mm -hmm. uh, but it's extremely raw, mm -hmm. uh, productive in that sense. It's the, the kind of um, the kind of energy mm -hmm. that I want my my work to be very aware of mm -hmm. and, and articulating with mm -hmm. in, in that sense. So nothing of what I do. Uh, both in terms of my academic work or uh, my literary work escapes the reach of how difficult it is to live in, in between borders. I come from a family of immigrants. I, um, I came here uh, in the late 20th century. <laughs> it was not the 20th century. Uh, knowing very little about the trajectory of my grandparents who had come here to this country in the early 20th century. And part of the project that I'm developing right now is, is very much unearthing that, that experience. And uh, when I heard, uh, as all of you did, the news about the caravans coming from, uh, from Central America crossing this taking this very dangerous uh, route through Mexico, I was reminded that uh, my family did pretty much the same during the early 20th century, and that they came here, they were deported in the 1930s, and somehow I think there is a connection, a very powerful connection right there, a sense of belonging, uh, like uh, my parents did all that work, they lived here, they established themselves here, and so I'm coming back to something that they created also for me. Mm -hmm. And so that is a question that, that belongs also to that, the, the experience of the border, not only in, uh, you know, in my generation, but generations that came before me, and obviously generations that will continue to do so, to you know, to um, start this, this very dangerous, the, the great journey of our times, which is migration as such. Mm -hmm. You were instrumental in the development of the first PhD program in creative writing in Spanish, right? Doctorado en Escritura Creativa mm -hmm. at the University of Houston in the US. Um, and thinking about these future generations, yeah. right, who are here. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the importance of having these programs in our country today? And what advice would you give? I don't know, we may have some native or heritage speakers here who yeah. want to be authors and are working here and they want to continue writing in Spanish yeah, from yeah. here. So. You know, I was I participating not too long ago in the commencement speech at, um, at Stanford University for the, the students in, uh, in this master's in Latin American history. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the first things that I told them was that they were going to be developing a career and living a life in the second largest Spanish-speaking country in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is the country in which we live mm -hmm. right now. So uh, it's second only to Mexico, by the mm -hmm. way, in terms <laughs> of the number of Spanish mm -hmm. uh, uh, speakers. And uh, uh, to me, it's, uh, it's very interesting that uh, we, in fact, la launched this first uh, PhD with an emphasis, with a track in, in creative writing in Spanish, right in 2017. I don't have to tell you what happened in 2017, <laughs> right? And so, to me, it's, uh, it's, it's very important in terms of the, you know, Aesthetics is very important in terms of Latin American literature, in terms of uh, the literature written by Spanish speakers in this country. But it's also, it's my, uh, my activism. Mm -hmm. It's a way of saying that we have created a place here, the experience of many before me, and the experience that, is, that we are um, inviting to coming to being depends on, on, on that, on being able to write books uh, in languages that, uh, that we use in our daily life, languages that structure experience in this country as well. Uh, uh, languages that are very much alive uh, and, that, um, <clears throat> and that belong to, to, to the world in, in, in which we, you know, we are. Uh, and um, I've been, when people ask me about um, 
you know, the, the state of Latin American literature today, what I, what I answer uh, with increasing emphasis is that um, a good chunk, an important chunk of Latin American literature is now being written from inside the United States. Uh, some of these authors write in Spanish, and some write Latin American or Spanish-speaking literature in English. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing way this crisscrossing, this sharing of worlds um, that come to enrich what we are, I think, as a society. So I'm very proud of this program. I, uh, of course, if you want to write uh, in Spanish, I, I invite you to check out our web page at the University of Houston. It is pretty much a, um, a bilingual, bilingual program at this point because uh, in, in writing as in real life, uh, we are using all our, our skills, all our languages to create a, a more complex and more nuanced experience here on Earth, I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, before we have questions, um, could you read maybe a passage for okay. us from the Taiga Syndrome? Perfect, I'll mm -hmm. do that. And I'm gonna, write, I'm gonna read uh, just a couple of paragraphs from the beginning and, uh, and hopefully we'll get a chance just to hear from you some questions here. Uh, the title of the first um, uh, chapter is the same, Lo Mismo in Espanol. That they had lived there, they told me, in that house, there. And they pointed it out with an apprehension that could easily be mistaken for respect or fear. Their fingers barely picked out from the cuffs of their very heavy black coats, the smell of ash under their arms, dirty nails, dried lips, their eyes having discreetly moved toward where they were po pointing, quickly returned to their original position, gazing straight ahead. What are you really looking for? They asked without daring to say so. And I, who didn't exactly know, followed their steps like a shadow back to the village over snow-covered trails. It wasn't really a house, I should say first. I would have described what I saw on that morning at the beginning of autumn as a shack, maybe not even, a hovel. In any case, it was a, a habitable structure made from wood, cardboard, and lots of dry branches. It did have a roof, a rich roof, and a pair of windows covered in thick, transparent plastic instead of glass. It had the air of a last refuge. It gave the impression that beyond was only open space, and the law of the wilderness, and the sky so blue, so high above the wild. I remember the cold. Above all, I remember the cold. I remember my clenched jaw, fist deep in my coat pockets. They had arrived there, according to my information, at the beginning of winter. I had, I had come to the conclusion because their last communication came from a telegram office in a border town about 200 kilometers away. The telegram, addressed to the man who had hired me to investigate the case, said briefly and somewhat obliquely that they were never coming back. What are we left, what are we let in when we say goodbye? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you. I think we have time for some questions from the audience. We have two microphones here. Yes, thank you for coming. I wanted to ask you about the mm -hmm. detective. Uh, you said that she was a failure. And yeah. I wanted to know what you meant by that, like she wasn't good at solving crimes. How do you how do you benefit from writing about somebody who doesn't have the skills to do what you're trying <laughs> yeah. to describe? Yeah. Uh, to explain yeah. that. No, that's a very interesting question because it, it, it is a question uh, that, uh, that is asking me to move away from efficiency to being able to do a task in, a, in the most efficient manner. That's what we more or less know as a success, right? Mm -hmm. being, being good at something, be proficient 
at something. And what failure in this case allows me to do is just uh, uh, is to digress greatly and to, and to ask uh, questions that come pretty much out of the blue. I think that's the, the, the kind of knowledge that comes from not knowing exactly what to do is, is just so rich, is so important right here. And um, I'm way more interested in, in, in how the detective is articulating the story, how the story making as such is a, is a matter of, uh, of, of her curiosity and, and her challenge rather than the direct solution of a case. Eventually, though, there is going to be a resolution. There, there is something, there is some knowledge that the reader will be gaining uh, by having, you know, journeying with, with the author and with the characters. Perhaps it's not the, the knowledge that we expect to gain at the end of such a journey. But then there is, there is something to be said about unexpected events. And, and that's very much what I'm aiming for right here. That's interesting because we describe detectives <coughs> as procedurals, mm -hmm. and you seem to have gotten away from that, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Subverting the way in which we do things usually, that's, that's something that I'm, I'm very interested in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hola, buenas tardes. ¿Qué tal? I just wanted to ask you about. Uh, one of the things that Beatriz mentioned uh, before and that is very much present <coughs> in the literature, um, when you speak about borders and, and bi biculturalism, what does it feel to um, write in Spanish thinking in English? Oh, how mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. But I mean, uh, what, because we, we came from, I mean, those are two completely different backgrounds in a way. I mean, Anglo Saxon and, and, and Romance languages mm -hmm. do not go necessarily together. So I wanted to know what does it feel for you yeah. to write in Spanish, to publish in Spanish while you are thinking in English? What, yeah. what does that mean? And Wonderful I question. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's very important. I, usually we have the idea that writers are masters of uh, you know, whatever language, their relationship with language, uh, of, uh, with language has to be one of mastery. And I think this bilingual way of approaching this, this matter allows me to, to work with the, the most fragile side of language, mm -hmm. uh, working with the, not, not with notions of mastery or, or domination, but with notions mm -hmm. of vulnerability and, uh, and always the possibility of misunderstanding, for example. And, uh, and so I think that's so useful for writing. I think writing, uh, in fact, uh, requires that relationship uh, you know, with language in general, uh, in order to be able to explore its limits, uh, you know, the sensuousness of language and all that kind of thing. But, and, and then I would have to say that um, um, I'm, I'm very much interested in the, in the connection, in the opposition, and the juxtaposition of, uh, of both English and Spanish. Um, I'm less interested in just the meshing of them as, as, uh, as uh, it's been done so well by, by Chicano writers and artists in something that is known as Spanglish. And I very much enjoy that and that kind of literature. But what I like to do, and, and I think what, what I've been working on, and, and this I didn't know at the beginning, that, that has come, as a, uh, has come a, as a realization after I've done the work, is that I, I'm usually working uh, with well, vocabulary in Spanish, some sentence structure. Mm -hmm. But at that level, at the level of the, of, the, of the structure of the sentence, there is a lot of mixing between Spanish and English. So the words might appear. It might appear that I'm only using Spanish. But the way in which this Spanish is, is being structured on page has a lot of influence of, of what I do on a daily basis, which is I, I live in English as well. I live in this country too, right? So I'm, I'm investigating, investigating that way more often, and it's as, as well a very productive, uh, uh, I don't, it's, it's, it's a challenge to me. It's something that I'd, I, I haven't mastered yet. It's a little <laughs> bit of a failure, so that's good. <laughs> Thank you. One more question here. Last question, I believe, according to our timekeeper. <laughs> Are you really thinking in English when you write in Spanish? Yeah. How can you tell yeah. 
Well, is that something that I don't think is a, is a I don't have um, um, a scientific way, right, of uh, establishing a clear path. This is where Spanish ends and this is where English begins. There is constantly uh, a way of, um, one language has a way of messing always with the other. And that conversation, that, that, that uh, constant, ceaseless conversation, I think is what, I, what I'm trying to capture in any case. So I'm not interested in the purity of either language. I'm interested in, in the way in which they're able to confront each other and to, and to join forces to tell the tales of our times, the complexity of, of you know, entailed, as I said earlier, by migration, for example, what, what does it mean to be able to write about something that, that from the very beginning involves the, the, um, the, ex, the exper experiences that are hard to fathom mm -hmm. from, from other perspectives. So that's a point. And that's uh, that kind of interaction, that trenza, in a way, that's what, uh, what I would like, that's my aim, that is, that's a place that I would like to get at when I'm writing. Yeah, thank you, thank you for your questions. Well, I invite you all to meet Christina. She's gonna be signing books in four? At, at 4.30 in? 9.10. So please stop by, say hi, have your books signed. Thank, thank you, Christina. You. Thank you so much. Thank you.